hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I'm very happy today to bring you a friend, a doctor, a drummer, an entrepreneur. His name is Dr. Lauren Isaacson, and he is the founder of North Star Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I nailed it. I nailed saying immunology this time. What did you think about that, Doc? I think you did a, a pretty good job. I, I concur. Thank you. You know, it took me a long time to start saying things like radiculopathy and immunology and ophthalmology. Everything ends in ology in this medical world that we're living in. So how are you today? Welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. No, uh, no major issues. Well, that's good, considering the world we're living in. Glad to hear that. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to um, give the audience a little bit of uh, insight as to me and you, me and Doc. Yeah. I, I don't know. Has it, It's been over a year. Uh, I would say, yeah. At Two. Least, at least that. Sure. Yeah. I have seen Dr. Isaacson play the drums in person. So it was pre-pandemic. So that means it's been over a year. <laughs> and I must say, he's a very good drummer. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we work together. We have some mutual contacts. Um, I'm always fascinated by the doctor that takes the entrepreneurial journey. So I can't wait to dive in a little bit. Um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit of where you came from and what you're doing today? Okay. Well, that's a that's a pretty long story. I, I don't know how much okay. time your audience has, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to condense it. Um, my background originally is in science, uh, and I've kind of studied in a number of places throughout the world. So I did a bachelor's of science in physiology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I did a master's of science in biotechnology at the University of Connecticut out of Stores, Connecticut. And I studied medicine in Israel at uh, the Sackler School of Medicine, Tel Aviv University. And then I came back and I did my residency in pediatrics at uh, what was then called the Schneider Children's Hospital. Mm. Um, I think it's now part of the Northwell Health System in New York, um, but the Long Island Jewish uh, Hospital System when I was there. And uh, I did some work as a pediatric urgent care attending for a while um, at the same hospital system while simultaneously doing some research at the uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in allergy and immunology. And I came down here to uh, St. Pete and did my fellowship in allergy immunology and pediatrics with cross-training in adult allergy immunology with the USF group over in Tampa. And after that, I uh, went to work uh, as an allergist at McDill Air Force Base. Um, I was not in the military. I don't have any military background, but I went there and started up an allergy clinic with, with their help from the ground up, built that and uh, stayed there for just under six years. And then I went uh, while I was there initially to uh, USF Mooma College of Business to get a master's of science in entrepreneurship. And I started founding my own clinic during my studies there and rolling forward. Uh, I think that uh, we're up to speed all while drumming along. <laughs> all right. So very impressive, of course. Um, I, I have a love for anybody that has been in, in pediatrics and I spent eight years in pediatrics, um, really uh, a gift. It's almost like for me, working in adult medicine and working in pediatrics, it takes a, a, it takes a special person in general to be a doctor, but it takes a, an extra special person to be in pediatrics because you really have to get down to their level um, in order to transmit information and not scare the heck out of them. Fair? Definitely fair, for sure. <laughs> so um, the entrepreneurship, of course, because this whole show is about the business of medicine. I spent a lot of time in 2020 talking about this panorama that we've lived in. Um, we're, we're about to merge out and um, we've started. Uh, everybody's getting their vaccines, hopefully. And um, now, you know, business as usual, uh, almost. So I'm um, a real raw answer here about entrepreneurship for you. What did you think it was going to be like opening up your own practice and what is the reality? Well, um, I think that uh, that's a, it's a tough question. You can tell by my pause, um, mm -hmm. but I, I think that I knew it was gonna be challenging. Um, 
uh, I think it has been challenging. Um, certainly the medicine part is not really the, the hang up. It's developing uh, proper relationships. Um, I, I would say that um, finding a good people with a good work ethic that are prompt and punctual and getting things done has been challenging in some respects and refreshing in, in other areas uh, when you find the right person to work with. So I think that's been a little bit of the struggles. Um, but outside of that, I, I, you know, I'm up for it. Uh, I think that I would rather have those kind of challenges or headaches because they're my own to deal with rather than sort of the ones that are baked into large uh, hospital systems and uh, a lot of people are familiar with those type of things. Yeah. So why don't you share with the audience a little bit about that? Why? Of why you decided to do this on your own? Um, because I think that there's there's so many. Like I want to provide value for the audience. I think there's so many doctors today that are they feel stuck, right, um, yeah. in the system. And and what maybe you could share a little bit of of your experience, and and hopefully it will help somebody else. Oh, yeah. And I, I definitely see a lot of that. Um, I, I think it's a bit of a shame. Uh, first of all, in terms of the challenges we face when you when you work in a large hospital system, you're not making any of the decisions about what technology you have. You're not making any of the major decisions often about who your staff is. Uh, you have to kind of just work with whoever's there, sometimes on a day to day basis. And that can be fantastic. There are some great staff members and then there's some others that just like any other position, um, it may not be an ideal fit. And, and that extends to doctors, by the way, too. Um, they're not exempt from <laughs> those type of issues. Um, so it, it's, it's a bit tricky. You have to be a bit nimble to work there. I know a lot of doctors are frustrated with the lack of autonomy, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it comes to their schedule. Uh, the, the template is certainly sacred ground um, for me. Um, and I, I fought very hard to make sure nobody trampled on that. And I, I would say that some of my frustrations lie uh, in that oftentimes administrative roles uh, blurred over into clinical roles with respect to staffing. But at the end of the day, if, if a patient is going to have an acute, uh, potentially fatal attack, I'm the one at bedside administering the acute care. And, and it's not really the person who double booked the slot who right. um, may or may not have any experience in medicine. Right. So, um, you know, that was that was definitely a constant battle for me. But as an allergist, I definitely had um, the, the unique ability to carve out my own space because there's really not a lot of us um, out there. There's not a lot of people who have that firsthand experience um, who know how a clinic works. And uh, so I think those were some of the things that were percolating in my mind um, when I considered uh, going to, to do this on my own. Are you uh, happy really... you made that decision? Pardon? Are you happy you made that decision? Yeah, I'm definitely happy I made that decision. I mean, it, I probably should have made it earlier. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, treating all my patients in the academic centers and in, in the military system. They were, they were great people. I was given a lot of good support in some respects. Um, I think that uh, I was a reluctant entrepreneur on some level. Um, I, uh, I had family who did fantastic in business. Um, and I... I it uh, wasn't my sort of uh, avenue at that time. Um, I think I probably had a disdain for business uh, mm -hmm. a long time ago and maybe not really a full understanding of it. And somehow you know, Michael Douglas's character from Money of the movie was stuck <laughs> in my head. <laughs> right. So um, it's interesting though, but as I started to uh, explore other things that I wanted to do in my life, I started to get really a much more open mindset about it. I actually started my entrepreneurship program uh, not with the intent of opening a clinic or anything, but uh, just to keep myself intellectually stimulated, mm. um, open myself to new experiences. And uh, a really great experience happened um, independent of that, where I got to go to a lecture in, uh, in Largo where Ben and Jerry of uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream came mm. and they talked about their experience. And it is a little bit was haphazard. Uh, maybe not all of it was quite planned out, but they figured it out. But one of the things that really sort of turned my mind to uh, business was their discussion about uh, one of them met up with a, an owner of a baker a bakery somewhere in New York, and this was at a Grateful Dead concert, so mm -hmm. that caught my attention. Um, of course. And, <laughs> so I, I guess the um, the gentleman who owned the bakery he had made a decision that he was going to uh, hire people 
that were essentially ex-convicts, but mm. not for anything that were like, let's say, you know, capital punishment deserving, but people that kind of just got a bad deal and mm -hmm. would have otherwise been unemployable, but paid their penance and did their duty to society and came out for whatever minor infractions they had, but with a disproportionate sent uh, sentence given to them. And he decided, I'm going to employ those folks, and I'm going to let them have a stability and a job to their life. And, um, and they can then go and feed their families and give their kids hopes and aspirations. Mm. And if I recall correctly, they had made some brownies or something. And they decided at Ben and Jerry's, they would make one of their famous brownies ice cream. And they do like $2 million a year in business with that bakery to help mm. now support and sustain these families. Wow. And I thought to myself, well, that, that is really the antithesis of, of Michael Douglas's character, um, right. from what I remember. And, and maybe there's something more to the social construct uh, that somebody can do with business and maybe be a little more open to it as I grow as a person. I love that story. And I, I wish I had been there. It was in Largo. It's right in my hood. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ben and Jerry, my goodness, those two are, they're incredible. I mean, I have heard them on podcasts before and I love how bold they can be. And I, I, I love that point that you brought up, you know, I think anybody that goes into entrepreneurship and, and yes, that means in medicine too, when you go into a private practice, this is a business, no matter what anybody wants to think if the business of medicine is real, that if you go in thinking, well, I'm going to make a ton of money. <laughs> You're going to be sorely disappointed because the beginning is really like, it's, a, it's such a grind and we have to figure out what works, what doesn't work. You have been very diligent. I've been able to watch um, and patient with human beings and with technology and testing and, and doing your own research and, and not giving up. You know, I mean, there's a, a lot of people when they see how hard it can be, they just throw their hands up and go, you know what, I, I think I'm just better served um, joining a practice uh, or a hospital. So um, I love that you've, you've taken the time to really understand what it means to be in business. And also, I, I think you would agree that learning from other people that are not in the medical industry has been very helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's also part of why I went to school. I mean, certainly you don't need a degree to go to school and to go into business. Uh, you can be very successful uh, with it earlier. But my sort of thought process was, um, you know, why not distill the, the experiences of others who have done this for 30 or 40 years and try to at least learn from their pitfalls mm -hmm. in a sort of prescribed setting? Um, and I think that that was very helpful. And I met some fantastic people and made some great connections that I'm sure, you know, will help me and other people going forward. Um, and it, it, I look at the clinic very differently than I, I used to, because now I can use all my creative thinking and, and pick which technology suits me for my workflow. And, uh, you know, it's nice if I need to go to a meeting, I just freeze that slot on the schedule myself. Uh, right. I, I have to do every job at the moment. I'm the check-in person. I'm the doing insurance eligibility and doing the, the visit, the documentation, but I have a, a vision and a plan on, and who I want to address that stuff with in the future. So, and I um, think that that's great. I think that everybody doing every job, you know, I remember just as an administrator, um, I spent my first two weeks working, running that pediatric office, answering the phone. Yeah. Because I wanted to see what it was like for my front office staff, what the patients wanted, um, you know, how we could, shift it, make it a little better, improve uh, some of the techniques, even the phone system we were using. I, I needed to test everything. So you having that opportunity in the beginning, you know, although sometimes we might think it's, you know, annoying that, you know, whoever thought you'd be answering a phone or checking somebody in, humbling at best, of course, but wow, what a value that's going to bring for when other people come in, because you already know what it's like. Yeah, and I think it's super important uh, as best you can, whatever business you're, you're launching, um, to know the inner workings and the nitty gritty of it. That someday you can pass the baton to some, somebody else, but you know that somebody might be sick one day. And mm -hmm. I don't think anybody should really be above uh, you know, doing whatever needs uh, done that day. Agreed. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been fun. And it, I look at it almost a little bit like art, like it's a blank canvas for me. And I have an artistic side um, and I enjoy doing some pencil drawings here and there. And I think that all of that is super important too. I, I've been reading a lot of books. Occasionally I'll post on LinkedIn um, I, and I read one on, on ultra learning and meta learning where mm. the skills that you acquire in one circumstance 
may or may not be transferable to another one and make the next process a little easier. So mm -hmm. um, I certainly have other aspirations and, and uh, you know, what I learned about making a website here, maybe one day I'll, I'll take a look at our band's website and touch that up. You know, I, there you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I want to get to the band, of course, but before we do that, hold on to that artwork because of NFTs. I'm sure if you, you know, anybody that's in entrepreneur land is like, let me learn more about NFT. God, I wish I could draw. Um, let's talk a little bit about North Star. Um, sure. First of all, tell me why you chose this name for your business. Yeah. And then I'd like for you to walk me through what it would be like as a patient to, to become a part of your practice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the name did take a bit of thinking. Um, you know, a, a lot of people just kind of go plain Jane and pick their own name and, and or some street name or, or something like that. Uh, I, I will say that I did some prep work for this. I mean, we're very fortunate uh, in our allergy society that we kind of have a handbook that's written by other allergists who've been in private practice and they make some good suggestions and you mm -hmm. take some and some not. And that one kind of just registered with me, you know, I, I think I've tried to uh, express on our website that medical information these days is very complex. And to me, it's like a giant C. And how do you know where to get to where you, you need to? And so the North Star has, has always been something that's been sort of a, a, a fixture and something you can depend on and, and guide yourself towards. And, and I certainly remember seeing it uh, camping a number of times when I was younger. And uh, you know, if, if you're in a tough spot, it's nice to know that you have a bright light that's got your back to look for you. So I, I think that's uh, pretty much how it came in the name. I love that. I love it. So tell me, because I, I know, so selfishly, I already know the answer to this, but I want you to share with the audience what makes your practice different, because I know you have incorporated a lot of technology. Um, I know that you're very heavily involved in telemedicine, which I think is like the duh, it's 2021, <laughs> you know, right. you would have to be, but um, let's give the audience some perspective of what it's like to join North Star. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. Um, I have in, invested in technology. I'll just sort of preempt that by saying, I, I think anyone who goes into any practice, hospital or, or otherwise, that you should really strive for excellence as your baseline level of care mm -hmm. medically. But, uh, you know, things, where the difference happens is, is when you have your bedside manner uh, and what other services you can provide to make people's lives easier in a rapidly changing world uh, with technology. So I happen to like technology uh, in, in terms of how would somebody interface with our clinic in an easier manner. Um, we've recently added a widget to our website that allows people, even if you're not part of the practice, to schedule with us directly without having to go through the hassle of a phone call right off the bat, we'd have to do an eligibility check after, but at least to like sort of start the process because people are busy and, and they got kids or whatever they got to do. And, and I'm a parent too, by the way, I have, right. I have two kids and I have <laughs> expectations and, and I'm a patient also. And mm -hmm. I, I sort of take the approach in our clinic that I don't like to view things as the doctor patient relationship as a very lopsided thing. Mm -hmm. Like it used to be, I, I look at myself as a database of information and we're coming together with decisions that fit you for your circumstances right now at this time, which may be a different decision in three months from now, right. or maybe a different decision for the person with the same diagnosis that's uh, you know, in a different set of circumstances. So, um, so that's one, I think, uh, differentiator. And, and coming back to the technology, um, I had planned to launch uh, my clinic with telemedicine a long time ago before COVID. And I had a chance to be part of a telemedicine startup that did quite well a decade ago, uh, but it wasn't a good fit for me right then. But so this has been on my mind a long time. And, and the, the question is, how do you remain HIPAA compliant and patient centric at the same time? So I did, I worked with digital check-in companies and I tested one and it didn't quite work out. But now I have a system where I can send you all your forms directly to your phone through a link and you can tap on it. And whatever you fill out, the vast majority of it will come into your record and save from visit to visit. Um, there are a few hiccups there, but, you know, I, as a patient, I can't stand going to offices, getting papers, filling them out, and then they Tell get Tell me lost. about it. <laughs> and then how many times, this. how many times can one actually write their name and the date? Yeah. Oh, so Lord. We're, we're looking uh, to reduce friction points for mm -hmm. people and try to give you, I mean, I don't want to think of patients like as consumers, because that sounds commoditized, but I want, people want 
that I want, the accessibility of, of ordering a package on Amazon yeah. for your medical care, you know? Yes. And there's Remove a lot the of barriers. You know, I always like to say, and I learned this from the former COO of the Ritz Carlton, because I love nothing more than talking about hospitality and healthcare. And hospitality comes with that patient experience. In order to have a great patient experience, you have to remove all of the barriers, whatever those barriers might be. And if you're unaware of what those barriers are, you have to test it more as what you said, you know, as being a patient, you have to look at it from a different perspective. So, yeah. And I would say that I'm definitely pushing the tech companies to move their technology beyond where it's capable. So I have to be patient with them. Um, you know, with, with COVID, a lot of these people just, like you said, scramble to get to telemedicine and just get basic operations going on. But for me, that was never an, enough. And so I'm working heavily. I just had a phone call with the development team and we're considering having me part of their, you know, their advisory section on, on clinical operations. Nice. And I'm, I'm contemplating whether I want to expend my time there. But so I would say that uh, we try to make tools available to people and, and it benefits them and their time and their efficiency in the clinic and our time. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a bumpy go in the beginning because some companies are up for the challenge and some aren't. But I think we're on a good path for our workflow. One other unique thing that I would like to talk about yes. from an entrepreneurial perspective, and this, this may help uh, some of the other doctors out there too, is I've had now three phone calls, about to have a fourth when we're done with, with, with this uh, podcast with a different person, dealing with uh, remote clinical trials and remote monitoring mm -hmm. um, of patients. So these are things like wearable devices mm -hmm. that collect data and will send off early warning signals to us, much like a seismograph. Mm. And, uh, you know, if somebody has labile blood pressure, for example, that we get a registration that is outside the norm and decide whether we need to act on that or not before mm. the patient has a hypertensive crisis and needs to go to the ER and rack up a huge bill or end up in the ICU. So this has got buy-in from insurance companies and doctors and technology companies. And this is a big area. And to, to piggyback on that, uh, somebody approached me about doing uh, completely 100% virtual clinical trials. And that's the conversation I had uh, yesterday, and we'll have a follow up with today. I have to see, you know, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew, uh, yeah, but sure. but I, I see a lot of um, you know adaptation with technology. So sorry for the long winded answer, but there's no, a lot it's to talk great. About. Listen, I understand. You know, uh, the thing that comes, the wonderful freedom that comes with entrepreneurship is curiosity, and and so many doors get open because you have your own business and, and being a part of something so exciting, like virtual, you know, healthcare, why wouldn't you want to learn more about it? Um, and what you were discussing reminds me, my father recently was in the hospital. He has congestive heart failure and he's a part of the Baycare system, which has been really, I have to say phenomenal. I don't say that much about hospitals, yeah. um, but really and truly having that insurance, they sent him home you know, with technology, he was weighing himself and um, a pulse ox and the hospital was alerted or the doctor was alerted anytime that there was a shift, yeah. which was so wonderful. They sent a nurse to his house to check up on him once a week. And all it is, is prevention um, to go into the hospital. So really yeah. we are advancing, but we do need doctors like yourself that have patience and understanding of technology uh, and how that fits best within to the medical system. Uh, yeah, and I would say that another sort of joy of it is I've been able to help mentor a couple startup companies that some of them are trying to make wearable or other medical devices, and they totally get, you know, the physics of it all, and they get, yeah, but they're not, they don't necessarily understand how that would fit into a busy doctor's day, and they wanted to sort of pitch their idea to me, which I'm totally fine with, but mm -hmm. they said, well, what do you think about going to another doctor's office, and I said, well, do you have a prototype? And they said, well, not yet. I said, well, I'm going to give you the perspective of, you know, whatever specialist you need to go see, who's got to see 30, 40 patients. Right. It's going to be a bit abstract for them mm -hmm. to not see how the thing works and maybe a couple of PowerPoints. So I think they ended up taking that to heart and made a prototype and got a little further in their path. So it's great I'm trying to give them a little bit back from what I learned in my program. I love it. Um, have you connected yet with Dr. Khalid Saeed in Tampa? Um, I believe so. He's uh, the concierge. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. we talked a little bit. That's great. I mean, I think that anybody that, oh, the open-mindedness and willingness of, of trying wearable devices and seeing how, you know, instead of, there's just so many doctors today, unfortunately, that are like, no. Yeah. Or that telehealth is going to take away, you know, the job of a, a physician. Like, you guys aren't going anywhere. We yeah. need you desperately. We need more of you, as a matter of fact. So, um, all right. Well, listen, I, we can't end this show without talking about the band. So sure. let's tell everybody about the band. You are an incredible drummer. Um, I went to see you in St. Pete one night with your beautiful wife. And um, it really was wonderful to watch. Alyssa joined us too. We had a great time. So tell oh, me yeah. about the band. And I know that you're doing a lot of um, work for, for charitable reasons too. Yeah. So. Well, first, thank you for the kind words. Uh, Yes, I've, I've been a drummer for over 38 years, um, originally with a jazz background from a fairly intense jazz background, um, and, and, and they were competitive when we were, were younger. Um, but uh, this band kind of came together. Uh, I guess it was formed a, a while before me, but people sort of come in and come out of it over time. And it, it wasn't by intention to be with other physicians. It just so happened that uh, a neighbor a couple doors down from me uh, was a physician, though I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of heard a lot of noise being played uh, one day and I came over there mm -hmm. and I was talking about it. And I, I'm not quite sure if they thought I was upset about the noise, but I made it clear that I wanted more noise. Right. So, uh, right, right. <laughs> it, it turns out that, that the neighbor was a bass player wow. um, and a cardiologist. So uh, I said, well, let's get upstairs and see you know, what we can do. And, and we sort of hit it off and uh, we've become, uh, I think, pretty decent friends and acquaintances and have kids of similar age and, and they get along. And um, the, uh, the chief medical officer at the time from McDill Air Force Base, who's, who's since retired, he, he plays guitar. And, and the long and short of it is he's now, our, and has been for a while, our, our lead guitarist. And uh, we've, been, we've been playing, yes, for charitable causes. Uh, we haven't really taken any money except for maybe paying the sound guy or something and the occasional pizza or something. <laughs> uh, but we, we, play, uh, we played at uh, the Highway Cafe uh, downtown. Uh, we've done some shows for hospice. We've done some shows for the American Heart Association, Gary Sinise Foundation. I think there was a, I can't remember, I think it was an Air Force member who had a son that was getting a liver transplant. And we helped try to raise a little bit of extra money for them. Wow. We're just happy to get out and play. You know, we, uh, we're not looking to make our livelihood off this, maybe in retirement, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, for COVID, it, it's taken a, a big hit. We, we didn't rehearse for over a year something wow. and then of course with vaccines come on board we managed to do a little bit of outdoor socially distant appropriate rehearsals and and uh, hopefully as we come out of the bend of, the, of this issue we'll be able to get back to some shows and as far as the type of music we play we, we play a lot of 60s and 70s music so yeah. Almond Brothers, Clapton, Zeppelin but I, I I do try to pull one of the guitarists out out of their their generation we play a little Radiohead and, oh and a few God, other I love things. it. So, uh, you know, if you ever want to check out our website, it's, it's the Simeon Theory. So uh, simeontheory.com. And uh, there's a sampling of our, our music. It's, it's not professionally recorded, uh, not yet, but uh, it's fun. It's great. It's great. I just thought I have to introduce you to Dr. Richard Shulman. He has a band. He's in um, the Sarasota area. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah, I love it. I just love so much. So many of my doctors that I've known and worked with have unbelievable musical talent you know there has to be something to it even greg savell who i worked for for eight years an incredible singer and you know plays keyboard and i just love it i think it's wonderful that you have these other passions um as well as being able to help us with our health so um dr isaacson always a pleasure to see you always a pleasure to talk to you we have to you know make sure that we're, we're with the times in 2021 and and catering to the short-term attention of, of the humans that might be listening today and cut it off while it's good. So sure. thank you so much for joining me today. Um, check him out. All of the show notes will provide your, your websites. I highly recommend um, this advanced technology that Dr. Isaacson is providing. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. So don't forget, if you mention that you have seen the show or listened to the podcast, Thai Technology, three months for free.